Welcome back to the Dry Fasting Club. I'm Yannick Wolf, and today we're going to be talking about the science behind how dry fasting helps with seizures and epilepsy. And with our blurb here, there's some amazing discussion to be had about dehydration and remission from seizures. And this paper that I'm going to be talking about it was just unearthed by me recently, and it's from the 1930s. It kind of got archived and just disappeared, but you're going to see some insane results and discoveries when it comes to dehydration and nearly full remission from problems like seizures. Do you know anyone that suffers from seizures? If someone suffers from non-acute caused seizures, meaning that it's not from a specific disease or a specific condition like low blood sugar or stress, then they're suffering from something that doctors call epilepsy. When someone gets diagnosed with epilepsy, they are given a few options by doctors. And it's not always the best of news, but there are things like anti-seizure medications, dietary approaches, and surgical interventions. But it's a bit of a gamble because it doesn't it's not like a one size fits all. So it might not work for everybody. And there are always risks of complications and side effects. But I want to specifically talk about dry fasting and seizures based on this paper from the 1930s that seems to have been lost to the ages. And if I were a conspiracy enthusiast, I would go as far as to say that it was hidden from the world's eyes so that people didn't know the power of dehydration when harnessed for healing. Although I'm sure liabilities and worries about the dangers of dehydration played a pretty big role, I think that it's insane that our understanding of dehydration is so outdated and that we haven't given it more attention. In this paper, The Dehydration Treatment of Epilepsy, the author, Fay states that one of the most common factors among epilepsy patients was the accumulation of subarachnoid fluid and cortical edema. So let's talk about this for a little bit. Nowadays, it's not uncommon to see things like cerebral spinal fluid abnormalities or things like cortical edema among people that are suffering from epilepsy. And that's basically the inflammation and water retention in the brain areas. But where the author of the paper thought that this was one of the most common factors. Nowadays, it's not really viewed as such a common factor. It's epilepsy is more viewed as chronic changes in the brain's electrical activity. Maybe the author, Faye, was just guilty of trying to really correlate dehydration too aggressively, like trying to find the, the missing puzzle piece. Why was dehydration so powerful and provided such a crazy symptomatic relief and he basically forced the puzzle piece to fit but let's look at his data because i think that's where these amazing revelations appear and then we can make some correlations so the data came from 22 patients that they put on periods of dehydration And he followed them for many months and some of them up to 30 months. We have the table here that he recorded and we can see some pretty crazy things. Faye states that if he was able to take infants and place them on a fluid limitation and dehydration diet for one year, he was able to establish nearly 100% symptomatic relief. That's crazy. And if we look at this table, we can see that some of these children were having almost a seizure a month. And they would go down to zero or as close to zero as possible for most of them. And around that same time, there were a few other studies going around on dehydration and ketogenic diets. And there's one, a study by Bauer that's mentioned in this study where he tested a ketogenic diet on infants that had epilepsy and was able to provide about 35% of the infants were able to get really good results. But But 35 versus everybody getting symptomatic relief with this dehydration period is crazy and something that I wish more people would look into. But you have to remember one thing. Symptomatic relief doesn't mean curing, but still it was a way to give the infants full remission without the need for surgery and medication. I mean, who wants to give infants pharmaceuticals? Even though there are anti-seizure medications that are prescribed for infants, they may have horrible side effects like sedation and cognitive impairments, and those things will affect the child's development and their future. So what did the diet look like for this experiment? Well, first of all, 
the author, he took only the most severe cases, so those having three or more seizures a day, and put them on this dehydration period. They were given a fluid intake of 40 ounces the first day, including milk and water, two bowls of cereal, a slice of bran bread and butter, and a salad with lemon, and that was given once a day. Then the next day, the fluid intake was cut down to 32 ounces, then 24, then 16. The children rapidly lost weight even though they were eating. Well, we know why that was occurring because we now know how the body taps into the fat reserves to hydrate the body in periods of dehydration. So fat, additional fat burn. So the, they would try to maintain between six to 24 ounces a day in all cases of them having between three to 16 seizures a day, all of them were reduced to zero seizures. 25 of the cases were still under observation after one full year and they were still free of seizures. Amazing. Imagine that your child, your infant or child is suffering from these seizures and how dangerous they can be and how they affect their health and then finding a way that does not require horrible pharmaceuticals with insane side effects or surgeries where they have to cut into their brain. Instead, all you have to do is modify your diet to be a more dehydration focused diet. Here's a concluding statement from the author. I am convinced that the use of the ketogenic diet is incomplete, both in its hypothesis and in its execution as a relief for epilepsy. The ketogenic diet is cumbersome, burdensome, and necessitates altogether too much discomfort for the amount of good that follows its use. Limiting diet and fluid intake at the same time affords the easiest and most complete relief from symptoms and attacks. What I think that was cool was that The ketogenic diet was already popular in the 1930s, and then it sort of disappeared, I guess, for a bit, and then started reappearing probably around the same time intermittent fasting started to gain popularity. And I agree with him. Following a ketogenic diet is tough. It's tough managing it, and especially if you have kids and infants that you need to put on it. Because honestly, putting kids on an easier type of ketogenic diet, like a zero-carb or carnivore diet, is too close to doing human experiments on your kids and anybody doing that right now to their kids is irresponsible because we don't know how important carbs might be for children growing up and activating mTOR. Okay, now let's actually look at dehydration versus ketosis for epilepsy because there was another paper mentioned referenced by uh, McQuarrie and this is what was in the paper. Some very interesting results were also reported by McQuarrie who observed frequency and severity of convulsions, and the occurrence of other symptoms in epileptic children when they were placed on different levels of water intake. He says concerning this treatment, the method which we have found to be the most suitable for the routine management of the epileptic child differs from the ketogenic dietary regimen already popular in that it emphasizes or emphasis is placed primarily on the establishment of water balance at a much reduced level. We believe that the effectiveness of fasting and the ketogenic diet is not due to the presence of ketosis per se as to the associated dehydrating effect. Wow. Now these guys are my kind of people. McQuarrie states that he believes the effectiveness of fasting and the ketogenic diet is not so much to the presence of ketosis, but rather to dehydration. I too believe that there is a big correlation between effectiveness of fasting and dehydrating effects. I mean, even when you're water fasting, there is a point where you enter this dehydrated state where it seems like you can't be drink enough water without your body just constantly dumping it and people go crazy and start loading electrolytes to try and fight it. But really, the deeper you go on a water fast, I believe that the dehydrating effect is what we're looking for and we just get that so much faster in a dry fast. Another thing that we have to remember from the study is that it was a symptomatic relief but not a cure because when fluids were given again in large quantities, the issues would return. This means that it was mainly symptomatic relief. However, being able to put seizures into remission gives the child an opportunity to grow up and develop with hopefully less brain damage and that is huge. Also, another thing that we need to keep in mind is that the kids were fed carbs during the experiment, and a lot of them. I would have probably limited carbs a little more, 
and focused on complex ones and lower glycemic ones. Maybe more berries, less bread. But at the same time, that is a difficult call, like I said earlier, considering that carbohydrates are carbon building blocks that growing children most likely require. High glucose environments are precursors to mTOR, and mTOR is the pathway of growth. So keep that in mind. Also, because they ate the carbs, carbs do have a hydrating effect on the body, so it may have kind of counterbalanced a little bit of the fluid loss in the diet. To really know what was going on and if it would have been better to change the diet into a more ketogenic diet, we'd obviously have to run new data sets and see how they affect them. But what does all of this mean for families suffering with epilepsy? Well, if you or your child is suffering from this illness, you've no doubt been told all about the ketogenic diet. It's pretty wild that it was so popular in the 1930s, but it's sad to think that it was just more of a remission and not a cure. Still, I'll take fluid restriction over pumping the body with anti-seizure medications any day. But what about dry fasting? Because that should be the question that's on everybody's mind at, at this point in the discussion. Well, if a ketogenic diet and dehydration played such a powerful role in preventing seizures, wouldn't dry fasting be even more powerful? I think there's a case for this line of thinking. One of the most powerful aspects of a dry fast is how quickly and how powerfully it stimulates stem cell regeneration. This could have been a bit of the missing key. If initial dehydration is the precursor for autophagy, the refeed after a dry fast is the holy grail of stem cell healing. If stem cells can't fix it, I doubt there's much that can. Personally, I think that it's something that you, as someone directly affected by epilepsy, have a duty to explore. If you have children with epilepsy, they need all the help they can get. Even if it's not dry fasting because you believe it's too dangerous, at least diving a little bit into this world of dehydration is something that you as a parent have a duty to do. And if you're really scared about this topic, then I advise that you dig into research about Ramadan, a religious daily dry fast that has been practiced for thousands of years in the Muslim religion, done for one month, once a year. Explore it and let me know how it goes. Good luck and Godspeed. Thanks for sticking around. If you liked the video, leave a comment and share your ideas. And if you're looking for very detailed and unique protocols, check out the dryfastingclub.com. You'll find a lot there. You can even book a quick chat with me. There's also a free Discord link that you can find on the site. And I highly recommend you check out the forums and share your insights and experiences about dry fasting. Uh, you can kind of treat it like accountability, but really you can help a lot of other people. And as always, remember, no two people are the same, so every fasting experience is unique. Good luck on your dry fasting journey.